Morning. If you'd open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, we'll continue our study. Uh, and as you go there, I'd like to just read from Psalm 116 to open our time together as we uh, study the Word. In Psalm 116, uh, verses 1 through 4, it says, I love the Lord because he has heard my appeal for mercy, because he has turned his ear to me. I will call out to him as long as I live. The ropes of death were wrapped around me, and the torments of Sheol overcame me. I encountered trouble and sorrow, and I called on the name of the Lord. Lord, save me. And then in verse 15, it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. We just ask as we put our minds and our hearts uh, to study it, that your spirit would make it alive to us. Uh, that we would be willing and uh, and ready to receive whatever your word, your spirit has to speak to us today. In your name, amen. So we left off last week with John the Bapti- uh, Baptist baptizing in the Jordan River. And as you might imagine, he was doing with his nickname. And he, uh, these people are coming and his message is very simple. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So people who were unrighteous. Sinners, people like Herod, who we've talked about quite a bit, representing these people who are rebelling against God, are coming to repent and turn away from sin and seek the Lord. And then we, see, we saw last week that a group of people come out, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. If the, the first group is the, uh, the unrighteous, this group would, might be called the self-righteous. They believed that they were following all of God's laws as closely as anyone really could. And so they were kind of the spiritual leaders of the people of Israel in Judea. And we find that John speaks tenderly to them uh, by calling them sons of Satan. And, uh, and so they were somewhat probably put, uh, put aback by that. But his point being is that while he could baptize with water. In other words, he could invite people to repent of the sin. And there's many reasons which cause us to repent. Usually it's the effects of our sin, because sin always has negative effects in our lives. It, it creates misery and unhappiness. And sometimes when we feel that, we have this tendency to come and repent. But he says, I can baptize you with water. That's the gift. That's the message. That's all any pastor can really do is bring an invitation. But he says, I'm going to point you to one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In other words, he says, there is someone who's greater than I who can actually do something to change the problem which causes you to sin, a rebellious heart. And that's really what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking to. And it is tied to, we looked at last week, this idea to bear fruit, spiritual fruit in keeping with repentance, that God does not just cause us to repent so that we might wallow in our misery and unhappiness, but that we might turn towards him and bear fruit, spiritual fruit. And I encourage you, if you didn't do it last week, you can do it this week. It's fine. It's not due till next week. Um, but I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uh, through 14, because sometimes in the church, we confuse this idea of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit as that which produces what we call spiritual gifts. And we want to be cautious of that. God gives us gifts, and he gives us gifts that, uh, that he can at times take away, and if we're seasons hand to us, and they are given and outpoured by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul lists a lot of those, those gifts. But the, but the point of the Holy Spirit is actually that we might know God, that we might have a relationship, and that he might change our hearts. And so I like to think of it this way. As a, as a pastor, God has given me the gift and the opportunity to preach, right? But that can be taken away. I could lose my voice. I could just get tired and not show up one week. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it could happen, right? I could get old and, and uh, not be able to do it anymore. But what stays with me right up to the end of death and beyond is the fruit of the Spirit. It's the love that God makes new in our hearts. And so we never want to confuse those two. One can be taken away, and one is with us until the day we die and for all eternity. That is the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul makes that distinction. 
uh, in to the church in Corinth that they don't confuse those things. So this is God's purpose, is to save people to the utmost. And that's really the gospel message, that Jesus Christ comes to take people who are rebels, who go against him, and make them his friends, that we might live in him. And so we see John's ministry is to point people to Christ, to point people to one who is greater, and that will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, in other words, change you inwardly, and baptize you in fire, so that even the, the terrible reality which is coming, which is death, cannot separate you from the love of God. In fact, it will reveal in your heart what you really want, what you really love. And, uh, and we'll get into it a little bit later in Matthew 7, where Jesus actually confronts people who believe religiously that they are doing the work of God. And, and he, uh, in, in, a, in a moment of great clarity, says, I didn't know you, though. Yes, you did prophecy. Yes, you exercised these particular gifts. But there was no relationship, no love of the Father and love of the Son and love of the Holy Spirit. And it's that love that we have towards God that is, stays with us and keeps us and that our deathbed brings out in us. And so let us cultivate that, those gifts, as Paul encouraged those in Galatia to do. All right, so we have the unrighteous, people like Herod. We have the self-righteous, the Pharisees. And then in verse 13, it says, then Jesus came. We have the one who is actually righteous. We might ask ourselves, what is righteousness that would be useful for us to turn back to Genesis chapter 15 because what did John confront the religious people those who were self-righteous with he says don't call yourselves children of Abraham God can take out of these stones children of Abraham so it might cause us to go let's look at Abraham for a minute in considering the idea of righteousness and in chapter 15 we see that God has called Abraham and Abraham is in this journey with the Lord and he speaks to, to Abraham and he says, Abram, do not be afraid. I am your shield, your very great reward. So what is it that God knows Abraham needs? Him. Where is Abraham's heart without Abraham's mind? Well, he says, if God's really my reward, then I should have children and, 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 and my name will go on and last. And so he turns to the Lord and he says, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? He says, no matter how much you bless me, Lord, it will die with me because I have no family line. I have no children. And so the word of the Lord comes to Abram and he says that Eliezer of Damascus will not be his heir, but instead a son who is of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. A child will be born unto you and then he takes him outside and he says look at all the stars in the sky your children will outnumber them and what does it say in verse 6 the, the famous verse that Paul picks up on in particular in Romans it says Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness that it was not something that Abraham did in order to attain something from God, but that God made a promise of something God would do, a miracle, something God, only God could do, which was to give him children while he and his wife were in their old age. And it says that Abram trusted the Lord, that he believed God, that he had faith. And out of that, God then credited to him as being right with him. What is righteousness? Well, I want to turn to kind of the technical definition of righteous for a moment and, and have us consider what does it mean to be righteous because we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless we have it. We have to be righteous. No one enters God's kingdom without righteousness. It's why um, John the Baptist is preaching a, a, this message of repentance. When I was a kid, my dad had this little shop you know, bench in the garage, and it had this little item on it. I remember it was like a teardrop-shaped thing, had a string on it. I remember asking my dad what it was. I don't know why. I have very few memories of being a kid, but I just have this distinct memory of him explaining to me 
that is a plum line. I found out after first service, it's called a plum bob, I guess. Plum bob. I think that sounds very Midwestern. They just like to say bob. Uh, <laughs> it's my impression of Canadians and Midwesterners. They just add bob to things. So it's a plum bob. And the uh, point of it is it's a tool that allows you to find a right angle. And we use the word right all in all kinds of ways. Uh, but you know, scientifically speaking, it, it, it speaks this idea that there is a measurable kind of way in which the universe is created. That there is a science to it, and that if you're building a building, for example, you need right angles. They're much stronger than you know, having a bunch of beams that are kind of crooked or at different angles. And a plumb line is one way. We use maybe a speed square, for example, is another way we measure a right angle, we use things like levels, and but we know that things should be square. It's our nature to know that there is right ways. Uh, a good example would be when we hang a picture on the wall. We stand there, and our wife goes up a little bit to the right, up a little right. We're trying to find the right place for it to be. Uh, I was at my mother-in-law; she's here, and. Uh, uh, the other day, and I was asked to go close blinds because it was dark and we were going to have dinner. And so I went around and I just kind of pulled on one side of it so it was a little bit crooked. And you say, why did you do that? I said, because I know my mother-in-law wants things to be right. And it brought me joy. I don't know why. Um, maybe we'll discover why that brought me joy. To mess with things a little bit. Well, I was thinking about this yesterday because I had nothing else to think about in the second half of the football game. Uh, and I was in a bad mood. I don't know why. But there was this commercial, and they were showing great plays. And, uh, and I don't know, I think it's Amazon or something is trying to promote science or math, right, and percentages. Have you seen those commercials where it shows you percentages of catches? Are there a lot of people into probability and statistics? In football, is that, oh, that you? Okay. A couple of us here. Well, here's my opinion of it. I think there's sometimes science, let's get out of the way. We don't need science for everything, right? Like, don't ruin football. It's the immaculate conception, right? Or reception. The immaculate reception. I came close. Beastquake. There are just things that we don't need the scientific breakdown. If you want science, go watch baseball or something. Uh, if you're into statistics. But science tells us something, that the universe is ordered in a particular way. And there are things which are straight and things which are crooked. And in the same way, there is a, a moral reality to our universe. There are things that are straight and there are things that are crooked. And the truth of the matter is, is that we live in a crooked generation. People who aren't straight who don't meet the moral standard. We live in a day where, frankly, we are suffering the terrible consequences of a humanistic philosophy that says the plumb line, that which is right, that which is ordering the universe is found somewhere in the human heart. And it is our great desire to try to draw that out of people. We are perpetually and constantly consumed by how we feel about things. What's our feeling about things? Do you like this? Do you not like this? I've been convicted about it, even with my own children. And as I've gotten older and I'm around other people's kids, I've tried to avoid the questions like, what's your favorite? You used to always ask that like a little kid. What's your favorite part of school? Like we needed to know. They're, they're animals. They're base-natured creatures. They like lunch and recess, right? Like, I already know the answer. These aren't smart people. I don't know why I'm concerned about what their favorite thing is. It's probably dumb, right? Which is why we let them stay upstairs during the sermon, so we don't offend them. They don't have taste. They only have appetites. They like chicken nuggets. And I am fearful that my generation has been a generation that has been raised to continue to only like chicken nuggets. Just chicken nuggets, that's fine. To never develop higher things. It's a better question than what's your favorite color, what's your favorite class, 
is to ask, what did you learn today? Look outside of yourself. What is beautiful? Isn't that a question that I would encourage you as parents to ask your kids? What's beautiful? What did you see that was beautiful today? Because God has created this world. In fact, on Wednesday night, I, would ask, I was asking that to the kids. What's beautiful? And most of them said, the world. I don't know if they knew it instinctively or they just, you know, they've been taught that, that that's what's beautiful. But yeah, it's out there. That's where the beauty is. Stop dwelling inside. When we look inside, what we actually find is something which Paul describes in Galatians 5, which is just the base nature. It's the natural man, which is often participating in things which go are contrary to God's goodness and his righteousness. We don't have to train our children in them. They come out naturally. They begin developing selfishness. And so when we go to my wife as a teacher and when you go to school, you know, you can say there's this whole thing called classroom management. It's why I'm not a teacher anymore uh, because I was terrible at it. I went to school to, you know, to be a teacher and all I thought about was the subject. And then I got into a classroom and found out that most of what teachers are doing is classroom management. How do I get 30 of these sinful people, selfish people, to learn and to think about something other than themselves? Particularly in a day when from the time they get up to the time they go to bed, they are inundated with messages of think about nothing but yourself. And so here in verse 13, Jesus comes to the, to the Gal- to the, uh, um, out of Galilee, to the Jordan River. And John says, look, here comes Christ. Behold, he says in, in John, in the book of John, behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. In fact, In Romans chapter 3, it's helpful for us uh, to remember about ourselves that there's a righteousness that we attain, which is given through faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 3, 22. The righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew or Gentile. We're all in the same boat. No sense in looking down on this generation or that generation or these group of people or that group of people because we're all the same. For all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. We are all a sinful people. And what John's purpose is to open the door so that we might see the plumb line, see what is good, see what is really beautiful. The human that is supposed to be, that we're supposed to be like. I read in in devotions this week, again from James Smith. And uh, and I'll just kind of copy what he says. He says, God is pleased or displeased with every thought we think, with every word we speak, with every action we perform, with every emotion we feel. Perhaps we do not sufficiently realize this. We think, speak, feel, and act without ever considering whether we are pleasing God or not. But this ought not to be, for he gave us our being, redeemed us from sin and damnation, called us by his grace, and has blessed us with innumerable and interminable, I don't even know what that means, but interminable blessings. And all that we may glorify him. And how can we glorify him? But by habitually aiming to please him. If we forget or lose sight of this, we forget and lose sight of the principal end of our being and our well-being. And this is what you're created to do, to please God, to reflect his glory. And when Jesus comes down into the Jordan that day, he shows us what humans are supposed to be like, what we're supposed to be like. He's the perfect one, the beautiful one. 
It's why John says his baptism isn't sufficient. That we have to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. Your human nature has to be radically changed. It's not just your appetite that is the problem. It's your will. It's how you use that. Whether it's for yourself or for the glory of God. Simply controlling your base appetites, which is really what the Greeks did, the Epicureans and the Stoics. They realized, hey, those hedonists, they're miserable. They're happy for like 10 minutes. And we realize that with our kids, right? Yeah, that'll make you happy for like a little bit. But misery is coming. So we have to change and basically civilize our children so that they learn to think ahead. Think outside of themselves. And you can do that to some degree. And that's certainly what the Pharisees and the Sadducees had figured out that by obeying the law, good things can come to you. But John says you need even more than that. That can just leave you in a state of self-righteousness. It's your pride. It's your moral will that is bent. This is why self-righteous people are the hardest to preach to. Because they are oftentimes blinded by their will. Blinded by their need. Now we don't see that in verse 14, do we? We see John, when Jesus comes next to him, realizing that he doesn't measure up. That there is a gap between who he is. And I imagine, I don't actually know. I don't know what John's thought life was like. I don't know what his life was like. It appears to be pretty devoted to God. But when Jesus came, he goes, man, there's one who's greater than I am. There's one who's really perfect. I've been working on uh, this project at our house to put new molding around the bottom, right? And when you get to a corner, I also learned it's called a miter cut today. I know people like to fill me in on stuff I don't know after church, so thank you. I appreciate that. That's how I learn stuff. But when you do a miter cut, it's like a 45-degree angle, I believe. And, uh, and so and you cut two pieces, and they should come together perfectly, right? And I found out that you, the first one always looks perfect. It's the second one that's the problem, right? And there's often a gap, sometimes a very big gap, that you have to, and I've actually learned more about caulking than I have about uh, <laughs> cutting things well. I just am doing a lot of that. I've gone through just boatloads of caulk. Um, but in our guest bathroom, when you're sitting on the toilet, and, uh, and you look down, I have one particular corner that I probably cut 50 times. I just kept running back to the shed, and I finally got it. And I look down, and I think, that's great. Now, behind, there's this other one that I thought, well, nobody's going to see that. So I tried to just caulk my errors away. And now I've noticed that the caulk has kind of disintegrated, and it just looks, it looks terrible. But that's behind the toilet. The illustration is to show you that each and every one of us, right, we might be able, through a lot of work, to get close enough to where we're as good as our neighbor, maybe good as the people who are in our family, probably better than our siblings, right? We can do enough to get close, but in our heart, if we were to really dig down, what we would find if we stand next to Jesus is that we're not close. It's ugly. It's not great. And John goes, listen, Jesus, I can't baptize you. You have to baptize me. John models for us the heart of the Christian. That says, I want to point people to his beauty, his glory, his goodness. And yet, we see Jesus come into the water with him. And it's not that Jesus says, no, you're wrong, John. No, you're fine. You're good enough the way you are. But he says, John, that's not the purpose of this today. That God has a bigger plan. And he's called you in your sinfulness to be obedient and to baptize me. Why? Verse 15, it is proper, it is right for us to do this, to do what? To fulfill all righteousness. 
The message of the gospel is that God is making a people to himself. And what distinguishes them from all other people, it's not the outside. Jew and Gentile, slave, free, man, woman. It's not those things. It's that there is a people who are righteous. That their thoughts, that their actions, that their life, that their will is always in perfect line with the holiness and the love and the justice and the goodness of God. That's why Jesus came. And that's why he goes into the water. And it says that John consented. And we have at this point this beautiful moment in which Jesus is put under the water and then he's raised back up. And it is the signal of the gospel message that Jesus Christ would die and be raised again to life. And in that act, he would save us from our sins. Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. It says, so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way. We do so no longer. Notice there's a difference between what the world sees in Jesus and what the believer sees in Jesus. The world sees him just as a basic, you know, like he's a leader, he's a good teacher, he's a moral person. In fact, many of the people when Jesus came thought maybe he's just going to kind of pick up where John left off. You know, okay, John, I got your disciples, we're going to get a band together, we'll try to form a government and you know, elect the Speaker of the House, that should be easy, right? And then uh, a little, little political humor there for you. Let's get an army together, get rid of the bad people out of Jerusalem. What would happen if Jesus came and got rid of the bad people in Jerusalem? There's nobody left in Jerusalem. You see, Jesus didn't come to take the throne. He already had a throne. He left his throne. He came down to save his people. That's what John the Baptist came to understand. That's what the disciples came to understand. That's what Paul came to understand when he wrote to the church in Corinth. And in verse 17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us this gospel message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And then Paul says that God made him who had no sin, the perfect one, the plumb, the righteous one, to be sin for us, to take our place, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That that just in the same way as our sin goes to God, so Christ's perfect righteousness comes to us. And we are seen as righteous in God's eyes. The same word that created the universe then opens the heaven in verse 16 as Jesus comes out of the water reminding us of the work the plan of salvation that will take place and a voice comes from heaven and the voice that created the universe says this this is my son whom I love in him or with him I am well pleased we see in Uh, John's gospel, that John the Baptist hears this word from the Lord. And he is made aware of the full manifestation of the Trinity, of the triune God, with the Father speaking in authority, with the Holy Spirit pouring his power, and the Son displaying perfect righteousness very beginning of the Bible, we see God create the world and create people and say they're good. There is something good in humans. We are supposed to reflect 
the beauty and the image of God and love and everything that we do. But from about chapter 3 on, it gets kind of bad for us. It doesn't take much reading in the Old Testament to go, things didn't go good for people. But now we see that God speaks again. And what does he say? He says what he said at the beginning. This one is good. This is good. This is righteousness embodied in a person. In him I am well pleased. If we were to go forward, we'll just look at it very briefly this morning. But in Matthew chapter 17, it says that after six days, this is verse 1 of Matthew 17, that Jesus took with him just Peter and James and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. In other words, the, in, in, in some mysterious way, God revealed to those disciples God's kingdom, his authority, that, that Jesus was the king of the universe before. That's why John the Baptist says he was before me. And what they see is this two guys that appear, and they see Jesus in his perfect whiteness, beauty. And Moses, the lawgiver, Jesus was perfect. He didn't break any laws. And Elijah, the prophet, the anointer, and Jesus was anointed with all authority for this plan of salvation for God's people. And I love in verse 4, Peter starts talking because he's, uh, he's going to be the first pastor. And so that's what pastors do. They they talk and say dumb things when they should be speaking the word of the Lord. And he says, Lord, it is good for us to be here, which isn't wrong. He says, if you wish, I'll put up shelters, three shelters, one for you, for Moses and for Elijah. He says, thinking through the details, I imagine maybe in his mind, it's like, man, we have Elijah and Moses. This is going to be good for us. And I love in verse 5 where it says, while he was still speaking, bright cloud covered them and a voice from the cloud interrupted his speech. And what is it that Peter needed to hear? This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. So it's an incredible message that God brings them up to the mountains to show them God's kingdom is more powerful than you can ever imagine. Trust in Jesus. Trust in him. Trust his way. You're going to be tempted not to. And Peter, even after seeing this, makes a shipwreck of his leadership early on. And, and often fails. And yet the message is this. Listen to Jesus. Behold him. Consider him. Think about him. He is the good one. He is righteousness. He is perfection. He is what we're supposed to be like. We don't look inwardly to ourselves. We don't look to our neighbors. We don't look to the religious leaders. We look to Christ. He is the one that we are to bring our life up next to. And it's hard to do. We have a tendency to shy away from it. And the reason we have a tendency to shy away from it is that it's uncomfortable. Have you ever been really bad at something and hung out with somebody who's really good at something? I mean, other than the Seahawks. Um, I just had one last little bitterness to get out, and then now I can move on with my life. But have you ever been in that situation? It can be embarrassing. It can be hard. But like John the Baptist, it is our calling to come to Christ, to stand up next to him, and to feel the weight of our sin and the weight of the gap, and to honor him. It is not our goal to spend our lives in a religious kind of navel-gazing, worried about the list that we make, the good things I've done, the bad things I've done. Pride will often lead us to be obsessed with one side or the other. We'll be racked with a constant state of guilt of all the mess-ups that we've done. or We'll 
Even worse, we'll be stuck on the good side of that, constantly bragging about how much better we are than other people. But when we come next to Jesus, we realize, man, I'm a sinner, and he is so good. And maybe I should talk about him. Robert Murray McShane said something, and I, I was reading in devotions this morning, and something like, for every time you think about yourself, think ten times about Christ. You catch yourself thinking about yourself, go, I need to think about Jesus at least ten more times before I think about myself. Think about his character and his love, his work. So much so in Second Peter, Peter's now maybe a little more mature as a pastor, and he's writing to the early church, and he says to them, in verse uh, 12 of First Peter chapter 2, So I will, remi- I will always remind you of these things, even though you know them and are firmly in- established in the truth you now have. I-, I love that verse because as a pastor, our primary job is not to tell you something new. It is to remind you of what you already know because you are a very easily and for- forgetful, pe- not easily, but a forgetful people. How much? How many of us forget often? And so he says in verse 15, I think it is right to refresh your memory as long as I live in the tent of this body because I know I will soon put it aside as our Lord Jesus Christ has made clear to me. And I will make every effort to see that after my departure you will always be able to remember these things. Remember what? Well, verse 16, For we did not follow cleverly devised stories, when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came from the mountain, from the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. He never forgot those words that, that, that God spoke to him, that interrupted him. They're the words that God gave at the beginning, and they're the words that God speaks to us today. What do you say about Jesus? Do you have faith that he is who he says he is, that he is good, that he is the perfect one, that you standing up next to him comes so short? And yet, he said that he took your sin and he died for it. He atoned it. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away your sin and my sin. Do you look forward to the day that you pass through death? As, as, as Paul often said, I, I look forward to the day that, that I pass through death and all my sin and all my sicknesses and all my struggles and certainly the pride in my heart are buried in the sea of God's forgetfulness. And I rise in perfect righteousness, to worship God and to be free of sin. This is the message of hope that we have. But the gospel message calls us to believe. The cornerstone, the plumb line, the righteous one is Christ. And he's the hope of all believers. So that Peter writes to the early church in chapter 2 of his first letter. He says, get rid of all the malice, the lies, your hypocrisy, pretending that you're better than you're not, the envy, constantly worrying about what you don't have, the slander, putting down other people because it makes you feel better about yourself. And he says, be born again like newborn babies, crave the righteousness of God, that pure spiritual milk so that you might grow up in your salvation, becoming more mature, becoming more like Christ now that you've tasted what? That the Lord is good, that Jesus Christ is good, that Jesus is the righteous one. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being placed next to Jesus. And when the righteous Come next to Jesus, what does it do? It builds God's kingdom. And it takes a world that is breaking down and begins to rebuild it. And that's really the message of the kingdom. You see, I lay in a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who what? Trusts in him will never be put to shame. Do you trust in Jesus today? I hope you do. I hope you can see your sin and his 
goodness. I hope that you can see that, that though you deserve his wrath, you can receive freely his love today. The forgiveness of your sins and the hope of everlasting life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you have done for us. And we come before you and ask that you would humble the pride in our hearts. Make us grateful for your forgiveness. Teach us to be like you. In your name, amen.